Hey everybody, and welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, we'll be watching Early Muslim Expansion, Part 3 of 4, by Kings and Generals. So, in the last reaction in this series, we saw the Muslims defeating the Romans at Damascus and preparing to move further into Roman territory. Um, you know, so far, we've seen them uh, inflict a series of defeats against the Persians. Now, they've finally moved on to the Romans. Uh, and they're seeing success so far, and I'm curious to see how the process continues. Uh, if you guys end up enjoying this video, I'd appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. And without any further ado, let's jump into this reaction. Emperor Heraclius couldn't allow that, so he started sending orders to the provinces in order to bring in more reinforcements to the region. Mm. Yes, yeah, so far Heraclius has kind of been hanging back, or at least he hasn't been leading troops personally. He's been delegating uh, to his subordinates, uh, and you know, as we've seen, they have not been very successful uh, against the uh, Muslim attackers. Simultaneously, the political situation in the Caliphate had also changed, mm. as Caliph Abu Bakr passed away in late August of that year and was replaced by Umar. Interesting. You know, I don't know much about the political situation in the Caliphate, um, but obviously Abu Bakr was an extremely important and skilled early leader of Islam. Um, so I would be, maybe we'll see, I'd be interested to sort of understand how that changed the situation. The new Caliph immediately started implementing administrational and military reforms creating new administrative positions in the provinces ah. and changing the formation of the army from the one created on the tribal principle to a more centralized one. Okay, interesting, because so far, you know, the Muslims have in some ways been similar to Arab raiders, nomadic Arab forces that we've seen in the past, just on a larger and more successful scale. But it seems like Umar here uh, is really trying to change that to... Uh, reform the army and the government uh, and to perhaps centralize power and take them a step further than they have been. Immediately after his ascension, Umar sent a letter to the army relieving Khalid of his post and appointing Abu Ubaidah in his place. Wow, interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I, maybe we're going to hear why, but Khalid has been very successful so far. I mean, he's been a very skilled uh, and talented general. We don't know if this was part of the reforms, or as some sources claim, it happened due to the previous animosity between the new caliph and the general. I mean, I would guess maybe some personal animosity, um, because it's kind of hard to work out a reason why he would remove such a successful man, um, though perhaps it was just a sense of reform. Um, Umar wanted to take everything uh, that was status quo and change it up, even if those things were successful. But I'd be willing to bet that there were some personal feelings involved there. In any case, it seems that before the messengers could reach Damascus, the three-day peace the Muslims promised Thomas had passed, and Khalid, alongside 5,000 cavalry, guided by Jonah, started pursuing the Romans. Mm. Thomas had around 10,000 people with him, both soldiers and citizens of Damascus. But instead of finding refuge in one of the nearby towns, this group was heading towards Antioch, and that allowed the Arab cavalry to catch up to them to the south of Latakia sometime in late September. Oh. The details of the engagement, now known as the Battle of Maraj al dabaj are scarce, but according to the Muslim sources, a cavalry detachment of a few hundred caught up and took position to the south of Thomas. The Romans immediately noticed them, deciding that they would be able to defeat this small group with ease. To the surprise of the Romans, as soon as the Arab cavalry and Roman infantry started fighting, another group of Khalid's horsemen appeared to the east. Although the Romans had thousands of refugees in their midst, they still outnumbered the Muslims, and a portion of their infantry formed up to face the new threat. However, a half hour after the battle was joined here, a third group of Arab cavalry started charging from the north, and the Romans barely got into a defensive formation in time to prevent it from breaking through. Jeez. Thomas I mean, you know, 
Uh, once again, we're drawing from difficult sources. We don't exactly know how this went, but I would say uh, it's not unlikely that you know the fleeing, demoralized Romans would be met with several uh, you know Muslim cavalry forces um, who were probably patrolling the area. Would obviously have been a lot more mobile and able to catch up. Um, you know, I, I'd say that uh, could definitely have happened. This situation was becoming dangerous as the route to Damascus was now cut off, but the Romans were still fighting on an equal footing, and the battle raged on three sides. An hour later, Khalid himself appeared to the west with the largest part of his army and uh -oh. charged the Romans. Despite the fact that Thomas managed to get a few units to this front, they were swept aside almost immediately, and the Arab cavalry was now deep inside the Roman formation. Thomas was soon killed. Oh wow. The Roman resistance continued for some time, but was broken within an hour. Jesus. Some soldiers and refugees managed to slip away to the north, but the majority of the Romans were either killed or captured. I mean, if, if this is how it went, this would be an absolute disaster for the Romans. I mean, they've already suffered a pretty bad defeat at Damascus, and now... You know, these are the remnants of that force that garrisoned the city, uh, and they have just suffered this devastating loss. So this is uh, pretty terrible. <laughs> Khalid lost just a few hundred troops. Immediately afterwards, the Arabs headed to Damascus and reached it in early October. Apparently, Abu Ubaidah already received the messenger from the Caliph and informed Khalid of his demotion. Hmm. According to sources, the latter accepted it without much protest, but it did change the flow of the Caliphate's expansion in the region. Abu Ubaidah was much slower and more deliberate than Khalid. I wonder if Khalid really did accept his demotion uh, with grace and without protest, because, you know, given what an ambitious and aggressive uh, commander he is, I feel like he would be uh, pretty pissed off. Um, I think most people would be, but I guess we'll never really know. Umar preferred a more hands-on approach to the armies, often issuing orders after every engagement, which slowed down the campaigns due to the distance to Medina. He even placed informers in the army, which made Abu Ubaidah even more careful in his decisions. Mm. At the same time, the Muslims received some reinforcements, bringing the total number of their troops to 30,000. Whoa. However, that wasn't the only change in command made by Umar, which brings us back to Iraq, where Khalid ah. left Muthana in charge of a 9,000-strong army in 634. For the next few months, Muthana, whose numbers weren't enough to conquer any more lands, implemented the tactic of raids in order to keep the superior Sassanid forces at bay. The details are lost to time, but the Sassanids, who were used to fighting in pitched battles, were having a difficult time containing the raids, and one of them even reached Babylon. Yeah, I mean, the Sassanids have been pretty roundly beaten by the Arabs so far, um, and so I don't think it's unsurprising that they would struggle to contain further raids with what forces they had left, um, also considering, as I've mentioned before, this is, you know, a sedentary empire, um, you know, with forces that are much less mobile than those of the Arabs. So the matchup is difficult in the first place. So, you know, it does make sense that they would continue to struggle against the Arabs. The best Sassanid commander, Rostam, who basically controlled the court of the 10-year-old Shah Yazdegerd, was reluctant to leave the capital, worried that it might incite another revolt. Mm. But Mithana's raids were too dangerous so the general decided to take command over the forces in Iraq and marched south, supported by the Sassanid generals Baman, Jaban, and Nasi, and the Armenian noble Jalinus. All right, while well, the Sassanids are really going for it, they're trying to seize the opportunity they've been given. I mean, uh, they're struggling against these Arab raids, but there are far less Muslim soldiers than there were before. So they're trying to seize on this opportunity to try and uh, defeat their enemy and take their land back. Let's see if they'll be successful. Even before this multi-pronged counterattack began, Mathana knew that he needed reinforcements, 
and mm. sent a messenger to the capital. Yeah. By August, this messenger was in Medina, just in time for the ascension of Umar. The new caliph appointed Abu Ubaid, not to be confused with Abu Ubaidah, to command in Iraq and gave him 6,000 or so troops to reinforce Muthana. The latter was now informed of the Sassanid counterattack, and when Jaban got close to al Hira in late September, the Arab commander abandoned it, retreating to Kafan. By hmm. early October, Abu Ubaid joined him, bringing the total strength of the Caliphate's force to more than 15,000, a similar sizable. number to that commanded by Jaban, who crossed the Euphrates and was now at Namarik. The details of the battle at Namarik are not clear, but it seems that Jaban suffered a minor defeat and was forced to retreat beyond the river. Abu Ubaid decided to fight the approaching Sassanid armies in detail and march north towards Kaskar. And you know, I mean, we've seen the Arabs do a lot um, being outnumbered before, particularly if they can, uh, as it appears they're also doing here, split up the enemy armies so they can fight them separately instead of all at once. Uh, they have found that strategy quite effective. Hoping to defeat the smaller army under Nasi and knock him out. Although the Muslims won again, the Persian army managed to retreat mostly intact, and Abu Ubaid, who knew that Jalinus might cut his retreat to al Hira, moved his army double time to prevent this from happening. Mm. Indeed, the army of the Caliphate reached the city before Jalinus blocked them. The closest Sassanid armies to al Hira were those of Jalinus and Bahman. A letter from Rostam ordered them to unite their troops, cross the Euphrates, and attack the city. In late October of 634, their united armies, numbering around 20,000, attempted to force the river near... I mean, they outnumber the Arabs, but not by much, considering they have united their forces. ...near Kufa, but Abu Abayd and his 15,000 were able to halt this crossing. Yeah, particularly given we're at a river crossing, you know, one side or another has to cross. Uh, and of course, um, if you're the Sassanids and you do decide to cross and be the aggressor, then um, the Arabs can defend that bridge with far less men. And so it doesn't matter as much that they're outnumbered. Um, but I'm not sure exactly who's going to do what in this encounter. For some time, the army stood in front of each other screaming insults until a Sassanid emissary approached Abu Abayd with Bahman's message. Either you cross over to our side and we shall let you, or we shall cross over to your side and you must let us. <laughs> Interesting. He's saying, look, uh, you know, we've got this bridge crossing in front of us. That's going to be difficult for everybody. Why don't we just have a fair one-on-one -on -one battle, huh? Um, I'm curious to see how um, the Arabs respond. Although his officers protested it, Abu Abayd was eager to cross and fight in a pitched battle, so okay. he ordered his army to do that. See I mean, it would have been better for them to have the Sassanids cross over and fight them on the narrow bridge, but I suppose the thinking might have been, well, if we both just stand on either side of the river, nothing's ever going to happen. You know, we have to fight eventually. I can get that. Being this... Bahman repositioned his troops slightly to the north, allowing the Muslims to move across and form up. Unlike pre- Well, he did hold to his word at least, he did allow them to cross the bridge. Previous battles, the Persians had a dozen or so elephants, and they were placed in the vanguard with heavy cavalry between them and the infantry in the second echelon. Abu Abayd's army crossed the river in two hours and started to get into formation, mm. once again with horsemen in front and the footmen in the second line. Bahman continued to wait, and it was Abu Ubaid who gave the order to his soldiers to attack. The Arab cavalry galloped forward, but their horses were scared of the elephants, probably seeing them for the first time, and <laughs> the charge stopped before it managed to reach the Sassanid lines. Damn! In response, Bahman moved his archers to the front and commanded them to shoot at the retreating Arabs. Yeah, I think elephants, and we sometimes see elephants in ancient warfare in this region, elephants could be effective militarily if used correctly. They could also be uh, dangerous for your own troops, but I think 
One of the biggest effects of having elephants on the battlefield was the intimidation factor. Uh, oftentimes, they would be intimidating to enemy troops, um, you know, given a lot of uh, these men would have never seen uh, a creature like that in their life, uh, a beast that large. It would have been pretty frightening. And in this case, of course, uh, the intimidation factor was effective against the horses. Um, obviously, the horses are coming up, um, I mean, same as the men, against uh, an extremely large foe, uh, a beast that they're unfamiliar with, they're going to be frightened. Uh, and so, as we can see here, that intimidation factor uh, was enough to halt that approach. The volleys killed and wounded many, and when the leaders of the army of the Caliphate attempted to move their archers forward to start skirmishing, the whole Arab line became chaotic and disjointed. The Persian commander used that and directed his cavalry and elephants to attack. While the cavalry was mostly stopped, the elephants easily created wedges everywhere they struck. Wow. The Arab army was slowly but surely forced back. The presence of the elephants was panicking the horses, so mm. in order to stabilize the front, Abu Ubaid commanded his horsemen to dismount. He led a group of warriors himself, killing a few elephants and their entourages. However, another elephant was sent towards the Arab leader, and soon he was killed by- I mean, the Sassanids have really got the advantage in one, in this one. Um, so far at least, maybe it'll turn around, but this is absolutely the most successful battle the Sassanids have had. Uh, I guess we'll see how it ends. ...by the beast. Many other Muslim leaders were killed, and their army started fleeing in chaos, and mm. the Sassanids started chasing them. Muthana wow. was one of the last remaining commanders, and he achieved some degree of discipline and organization at the crossing, leading the rearguard and allowing the remainder of the army to retreat. He was badly wounded during the fight, but his actions saved thousands. I mean, major respect that he was there until the last moment. He was, even in this disastrous loss, directing his men back over the bridge, coordinating an organized retreat. Um, it was already really terrible, but if he hadn't been there to do that, it could have been even worse. The Battle of the Bridge was the first battle the Persians won in this war. Yeah. More than 10,000 Muslims lay dead, while wow. the Sassanid casualties were around 2,000. Yeah, I mean, this is the first major loss we've seen uh, the Arabs take, and it's a pretty disastrous loss. I mean, approaching with 15,000 men and losing 10,000 of them, this is a pretty big Sassanid victory. Uh, their first one, <laughs> and a pretty impressive one. Over the following weeks, Bahman didn't pursue Muthana, who withdrew to Ulays and returned to Tessiphon. Mm. Some sources claim that there was another rebellion against Rostam, others that Bahman was sent to deal with the Turkic raiders. The sources are also conflicted on the events that happened in Iraq later in 634 and then in 635, with some chronicles asserting that Muthana's army deserted wow. and he abandoned all the previous conquests, and others stating that the Sassanids sent a large army under Miran, and it was decisively defeated at Buwayb in April of 635. See, and this comes back to the issue with sources. We literally have conflicting reports that are extremely different. Um, and, and, you know, like I said before, and like you guys have pointed out, this era in particular, uh, and this region, the, the history, the sources are really sparse and quite inaccurate. So oftentimes we have sources that might conflict or, you know, may see things from a different perspective, but we can reconcile elements. Um, the two scenarios that they just presented are completely different. So as a historian, that's got to be really challenging to say, well, what on earth actually happened? Uh, for a lot of the stuff here, we basically have no idea. We're doing uh, a lot of guesswork, um, although we, we do know the vague, uh, you know, generalizations of what happened. But the details, uh, even some of the broader details, are pretty fuzzy. In any case, this lull in action allows us to return to the Levant. Mm. Back to the Romans. The Muslim army was getting used to the new command structure, and using this pause, Heraclius was bringing more forces into the region, by land to Antioch, 
and, as the Romans had complete naval control, by sea to the various ports. Mm. The second group was to be commanded by Theodore Trithyrius, the treasurer of the empire, and in December of 634, it started assembling to the west of Pella. Yeah, I feel like using the navy to resupply and send in reinforcements has got to be a pretty effective strategy for the Romans. I mean, they definitely have that over the Arab forces because, and maybe I'm wrong here, but at least at this stage, I can't imagine the Caliphate has, um, you know, a well-established navy. I mean, it's mostly a land power. I'm sure it would develop one over time, but um, I would guess that the Romans have that advantage at this time. Which was the perfect place to launch an eastward attack, cutting the line of communications with Arabia. It is not clear how big this army was. Spies had informed Abu Ubaidah about this threat in December, mm. and in early January of 635, he marched south towards Pella, leaving a corps under Yazid behind. As soon as the small garrison of Pella learned of this, it retreated towards the main army, flooding the River Jordan and creating a swamp-like territory dividing the Byzantine and Arab armies. Hmm. After occupying Pella, the Arab army commanders decided to move towards Baisan to engage Theodore. They didn't know the terrain of this area well, so soon after, the vanguard led by Khalid got stuck in the mud, and the Muslims were forced to withdraw back to Pella. Uh -oh. Theodore waited for a week or so, hoping that his foes would become less vigilant. On the 23rd of January, he marched his troops towards the river with a plan to attack the Muslim camp at night. However, the Muslims had placed scout troops along the river, so as soon as the Romans started crossing, the Arab camp was informed of it and started to form up for battle. Mm. We have only limited details on the battle, which, according to the Arab sources, raged through the night and most of the next day. The yeah, just, and this is a very broad point, but just imagining a nighttime battle uh, in these sort of conditions, in this time period, it's got to be an extremely chaotic scene. I mean, the whole goal of the Roman raid is to catch the Arabs unaware uh, and to destroy and raid their camp while they're still getting prepared. Now, that didn't happen. Um... You know, they had time to prepare, but even still, you're fighting under torchlight. In some places, it's going to be pitch black, basically, and even where there is light, it's probably pretty faint. So just imagine the chaotic melee that's going on. There's probably comrades accidentally killing other comrades, people, you know, just getting hit out of nowhere. Um, it's got to be a pretty <laughs> insane uh, thing to experience. I would say an insane sight. But uh, there's not much to see, that's the whole point. Romans were able to push their counterparts back to the camp using their slightly larger numbers. According to one chronicle, Theodore was wounded in one of the charges, and the resultant loss of morale made the Romans retreat. Mm. When they began crossing a marsh, the Arabs used this to their advantage. They attacked, killing thousands. The rest returned to Baisan. Jeez. Whatever was left of the Roman army dispersed into various garrisons to the west and south, while mm. Theodore returned to Antioch by sea. There was no army to fight back against Abu Ubaidah, so he divided his army into corps to conquer as many cities as possible. Shurabil took Baisan and then Tiberias. Afterwards, Shurabil and Amr bin al-As went south, while Abu Ubaidah and Khalid marched north. By March of 635, the Muslims were in control of the whole region to the south of Beirut, save for Caesarea, which withstood a siege reinforced by Heraclius, and Jerusalem, which had the strongest fortifications. Yeah, I mean, once again, we're seeing, you know, uh, the forces of the Caliphate able to take lots of land very quickly, um, you know, against these large empires who are really struggling to hold on to the land that they have. Though, as mentioned before, at this point, this may not look completely out of the ordinary. I mean, the Romans experience a lot of raids along their borders and a lot of raids that they struggled to repel. And, you know, they would lose territory at different times and reclaim it. Um, this 
may have seemed bigger scale <laughs> than uh, most other raids, but at this point, it still may not have been too much cause for concern. You know, they might be thinking, well, we get raided a lot, sometimes we do lose territory, but eventually we regain it, you know? Um, there's only so much they can do, whereas, you know, we're here, uh, we're established, and over time we can gather enough forces to um, fight off the Arabs and reclaim our land. Um, so at this point, you know, to the Romans, it probably doesn't seem like too much of a big deal. Of course, in retrospect, we can see that this is the beginning of something much bigger. Um, and soon enough, the Romans will also see that. Heraclius probably thought that the Muslims would be busy with the sieges, and he had some time, so he was recruiting in order to counterattack in 636. Mm. Simultaneously, an alliance with Yazdegerd was established. Mm. Heraclius married his granddaughter to the young Sassanid Shah. It was planned that the Persians would attack Muslim positions from the east. Although this does let us know that, you know, the, the, both the Romans and the Persians felt like the Muslims were enough of a threat that they were willing to <laughs> put aside their differences and work together. Now, um... It's not, like, insane that they would work together towards a common goal. Uh, the relationship between the Romans and the Persians was, um, you know, sometimes friendly, sometimes very much not friendly. Um, often they would be fighting against each other, there would be frequent border skirmishes, but other times they would be a lot more friendly. Um, and, I mean, you know, just before this, there was a lot of fighting between the Romans and the Sassanids. In fact, Heraclius... Um, fought pretty major conflicts against the Persians um, in order to reclaim Roman land, but, you know, clearly they've decided that this threat is worth working together towards. Meanwhile, Abu Ubaidah's 15,000 were moving north, and by November took over the territory between Damascus and Emesa, putting this major city in danger. Hmm. Heraclius rushed reinforcements, which brought the strength of the garrison commanded by Habes to 8,000. In early December, the city was besieged. Habes hoped that the Arabs, who weren't used to the cold, would not be able to sustain the siege for too long. At the same time, Amessa was a well-fortified city, with walls one mile in diameter, a moat surrounding it, and a citadel within the walls. So the defender's situation wasn't hopeless. Mm. The Muslims weren't strong at the art of siegecraft at that point, and the lack of siege weapons made an assault impossible. Yeah, I mean, though the Muslims are trying to recalibrate and reform their forces, um, you know, they still have been a sort of nomadic, mostly, or at least primarily cavalry force for a while, and I'd imagine, you know, that still predominates their strategy, um, and, you know, they're, they're military. Um, and of course, if you're a, you know, hit and run cavalry type army, you're going to have a hard time sieging cities, particularly, um, impressively walled cities like this. And, you know, if you're in a walled city that has well-built defenses, which you very well might have if they were, uh, built during, uh, you know, classical Roman times, and you have either a large supply of food or you can keep resupplying the city, um, you know, you'll probably be able to hold out for quite a while. And I mean, against other tribes, raiders, nomadic forces, cities would hold out, and oftentimes, eventually, they would just pay um, these tribes a ransom for them to basically clear off, like, look, we'll pay you some silver, and you can stop besieging our city. That's usually what it would come to, but of course, you know, we've seen a lot of Muslim victories so far, so this is a bit of a different situation. So for weeks and then months, the sides did nothing but exchange arrow volleys. By March of 636, winter began to subside, and it was becoming clear that the Arab army was planning to starve the Emesans. Mm. Food supplies were getting dangerously low. So Habiz decided to sally out and kill as many foes as possible, believing that it might end the siege. He left small units to defend the walls and concentrated more than 5,000 near the southern gates. 
Initially, this sortie was very successful. The Muslims were caught unprepared and were outnumbered two to one, which led to hundreds of casualties and forced them to retreat. All right, I mean, this is going well for the Romans so far. It's like a Damascus situation, but if that initial sortie had actually gone well. The question is, will it continue to go well? They're still in a dangerous position, besieged uh, on at least three sides. If they can defeat their enemies here, uh, perhaps it won't be four sides, but they're still struggling for supplies. Under Harbees' pressure. However, Khalid managed to get his cavalry together, arriving to the area of battle shortly after. The numbers were now on the Arab side, and mm. this was enough for the Romans to break off the fight and return to the safety of the walls. The defenders were jubilant, and not at all surprised when the Muslim army gathered to the south and started withdrawing. Mm. Abiyiz decided that he could score a brilliant victory, and immediately marched out of the city with the same 5,000. Okay, well, be careful, my friend. I mean, you've just scored a small victory. Um, let's not get ahead of ourselves. He caught up with the retreating Muslims a few miles to the south, but as soon as his mounted troops started charging, Abu Ubaidah's units turned back and attacked. A few uh, minutes later, the Romans were surrounded from all sides. I, I understand the idea. You know, the Romans have just had this minor victory. They want to press their advantage. They're in a pretty desperate situation still. They've had this victory, as kings and generals put it. They're feeling jubilant. They want to make sure they don't let this opportunity escape. But unfortunately, I fear they allowed that to blind them to the fact that they're still surrounded. Um, you know, even if a force on one side of the city is weak, there are still Muslim forces around the rest of the city. Um, and, you know, I think the Muslims would definitely coordinate something like this, and they did. So this, it seems like a bad mistake on the part of the Romans. Habiz was killed, and only a few hundred of his soldiers escaped. After a short battle, the Arabs returned to the city, and the garrison, which was left leaderless, surrendered. Mm. Meanwhile, to the north, Emperor Heraclius had been preparing an army to counterattack for some time. Mm -hmm. Various sources provide numbers of this army ranging from a very modest 30,000 to the fantastical 400,000. <laughs> yeah, the 400, the, like, it, it's just ridiculous. It's nowhere, it's not going to be anywhere close to that. The Romans, I don't think, could manage to gather 400,000 troops if the survival of their entire empire depended on it. It's just not something that Heraclius would even have been close to capable of. And of course, we see those inflated numbers uh, in an attempt to make the Muslim achievements appear more impressive. We see this throughout history. In fact, uh, the Romans were, uh, particularly in their older days, look back at Caesar, were notorious for doing this. They would inflate, um, vastly inflate, the numbers of enemies uh, that they fought each battle to make their victories look more impressive. Um, so we see that here as well, but it's just, I mean, 400,000 is a ridiculous number. I would guess it was far closer to the lower end of that scale. It should be noted that the chroniclers who wrote on this war lived at least one or two generations after the events, so mm. their depictions weren't based on first or even second-hand accounts. We know yeah. that at the peak of the Byzantine Sassanid War of 602 to 628, Heraclius mm. was able to raise an army of 70,000 for his attack on the Sassanid. And this is exactly what I'm saying. You know, this was a pretty major war against the Sassanids, um, and the Romans were really in trouble at one point. You know, Heraclius personally led an army against the Sassanids. This was a really big deal. The emperor out in the field, and he managed to raise 70,000 men. So do you really think that he would be able to raise more than that to fight off, um, you know, this Muslim threat, which, you know, clearly he understood was dangerous, but, uh, you know, I don't think he would have seen it as more dangerous than the whole Sassanid Empire. Um, nor, you know, do I think he would have been able to raise that many men so shortly after he just had. So, yeah, I think we're talking about definitely less than 70,000, uh, in my opinion, though. I'm not sure if we have any other, <laughs> say, archaeological evidence on this issue, 
Um, of course, it's really difficult to work out actual troop numbers, but just from a sort of informed guess, I would assume 70,000 or less. Empire, but that army had a considerable Gurkturk element. At the same time, the Byzantines had to keep some forces in Italy, the Balkans and the mm -hmm. Caucasus, in order to check the encroaching Lombards, Slavs, Avars and Khazars. In our opinion, the Byzantines outnumbered their opponents at least two to one, but considering the logistical situation in the area of operation, their numbers were below 100,000. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I would probably say less than 70,000. Um, you know, still, as they said, outnumbered the Muslim forces two to one. That's still, uh, you know, uh, a big discrepancy. They've still got a lot more forces than the Arabs do, but yeah, definitely... Uh, on the far lower end of the uh, the scale uh, of how large the supposed Byzantine army was. Heraclius, who was now in his 60s, suffered from edema, so he wasn't going to lead the army, predominantly mm. made of Greeks, Armenians and Christian Arabs, personally. Instead, the army was divided into five columns, commanded by five generals. The plan was to engage and surround the Muslim forces around Emesa and use another column to take Damascus and prevent the troops of the Caliphate operating to the south from reinforcing the northern group. The army left Antioch in the middle of June. Unfortunately for the Romans, a few days before their leading column reached Emesa, the Arabs learned about the counterattack, either from their spies or from the prisoners they took while raiding Shizar. So Abu Abaida ordered his corps to fall back. Mm. Initially, the idea was to retreat to Damascus to preserve this conquest, but the city was surrounded by open space that would have given an army with superior numbers an advantage. So the Arabs started retreating towards Jabia, which was located between the river Yarmouk to the south, Lake Tiberias to the west, and the desert to the east. Messengers were sent to the southern group with the order to march towards Jabia. Mm. The Byzantines, who barely missed an opportunity to crush their opponents around Emesa, started chasing the Arabs. Yeah, so, just on the troop numbers again, not 400,000, but the Byzantines have assembled a pretty, I think, impressive number of men. Um, and as you can see, they're really going on the attack now. They're really going for the Arab forces, trying to finally clear them out of the Empire's territory. Slowly coalescing after taking the city. They retook Damascus and continued south, and sometime in the middle of July 636, their vanguard made contact with the Caliphate's rearguard to the north of Jabia. The Arab commanders, who initially liked their position, now understood that they might be attacked from the southwest via mm. the narrow passage between Lake Tiberias and the River Yarmouk. The Byzantine field army could have engaged them from the front, while the garrison of Caesarea might have attacked using the passage. Therefore, Abu Abaida left Khalid in command of the rearguard and started repositioning his troops. The latter engaged the Byzantine vanguard, led by the light Christian Arab horsemen, allowing the rest of the army to move unharassed. The Muslims encamped in the eastern part of the plain of Yarmouk. Some distance to the east of them were the lava hills stretching from north to east of Ezra and the mountains of Jabal ad Druz. A few days later, probably in the last days of July, the Roman army entered the plain and built a fortified camp in its western part. I'm just going to say before we get into this, if you don't know, we are leading into a very important battle. Um, uh, I won't give anything away if y'all are unfamiliar, but, you know, hey, pay attention now. You know, this is uh, really crucial stuff coming up. <laughs> With the central portion of the plane left unoccupied, the army started preparing for battle by scouting the enemy positions. Mm. The sources mention extensive negotiations, which continued for weeks, but the details of the talks are convoluted. In short, I mean, and that, that makes sense to me. This would be the time to negotiate. Basically, the Arabs, uh, the Muslims are all concentrated here, and the Romans have basically brought everything to the table. They're 
finally ready to fight back. And so it makes sense there would be extensive negotiations between the two. I imagine the Romans are probably like, here we are. We brought everybody here. We're ready to fight. You do not want to go up against us. So now's your time to surrender, retreat, make a deal with us. Um, you know, of course, I'm sure the Muslim forces didn't want to accept that. But, um, you know, there's probably a lot of back and forth seeing if they could get an acceptable deal. They ended in failure and the battle was inevitable. Mm. According to some sources, the Caliph's reinforcements, consisting of 5,000 famous Yemeni archers and 1,000 footmen who were veterans of the earliest Muslim campaigns in Arabia, joined mm. the army sometime during this negotiation. Okay, the elite troops are bringing in the best of the best. Um, I'm sure they understand uh, the importance of what's about to happen. The battlefield was enclosed on its western and southern sides by deep ravines. To the west, Wedi Urakad flowed into the Yarmouk River near Yekasa. This stream ran northeast to southwest for 11 miles through a deep ravine with very steep banks. The ravine was crossable at a few places, but there was only one main crossing where the village of Kafir Ulmar stands today. Mm. South of the battlefield ran the canyon of the Yarmouk River while deserts occupied the north and east of it. The plain was mostly flat, save for a small hill called Samain. On the 14th of August, the Roman army moved forward and started forming up to the east and north of Alan. It is debated whether the army was commanded by the Armenian general Vahan, or each of the five corps had a separate leader. Mm. The Byzantine army positioned itself as follows. The light Ghassanid cavalry of Jabala was stretched across the plain as the vanguard. As always, uh, in a very long-standing Roman tradition, they draw their cavalry uh, not necessarily from Roman horsemen, but from, uh, frankly, the better trained uh, horsemen of uh, allied tribes. Uh, in this case, the Ghassanids, but we can see this throughout Roman history. Um, they, you know, usually... Um, took a lot of their cavalry from uh, allied tribes or tribes who were willing to fight alongside them because, um, you know, these were, uh, you know, we're talking about tribes, usually nomadic tribes, who had been uh, raised from birth riding um, and training on horses. So they were much better equipped to do the job than Roman horsemen were with the objective of screening the army and skirmishing with the enemy. Canatir commanded the left flank, while Grigori was on the right flank, and two mm. central corps were led by Dejan and Vahan. The Romans had spear and sword infantry in the first rank, archers in the second, and cavalry behind them. And I think you can actually, uh, aside from the historical context, you can tell how important this battle's gonna be. Uh, from the detail they're going into in describing the Roman forces. Um, you know, we're getting more detail here than I think we've gotten in any other battle. Um, that's just a sign of um, the significance of the battle that is about to be fought. Although Abu Ubaidah was the overall commander appointed by the Caliph, sources claim that he allowed Khalid to be the one giving the orders. Hmm. The Muslim force... I mean, you know, Khalid is... Uh, he has proven himself so far, so, um, you know, uh, I suppose there could, I wouldn't be surprised if sort of ego would get in the way of him handing command over to Khalid, but if that wasn't a problem, then the smart decision may have been to give decision-making power over to Khalid, but of course we don't really know what happened. Force matched the widths of the Roman army. But as it was smaller, its formation wasn't as deep. Khalid moved some of his light cavalry to the vanguard to observe the Romans. The infantry was divided into four corps, made up mm. of nine units each, with infantry in the front and archers behind them. There were three cavalry units behind each flank and center, while Khalid's mobile cavalry unit served as a reserve. The Arab commander's plan was to defend and tire his foe, and then counterattack when possible. Both armies had a southern flank secured by the river Yarmouk, while the northern flank bordering the desert offered a chance to outflank the enemy. Yeah, 
Um, I, I imagine particularly for the Arabs, um, or the Muslims, I should say, given that they're so outnumbered, they're going to be looking for those opportunities to outflank, maneuver, move around, um, also because that's what they do. That's been their strategy up until this point. So uh, I keep an eye on them for those sorts of maneuvers and that sort of mobility in battle. The Battle of Yarmouk started on August 15th, 636, with the Roman Light Cavalry Vanguard moving behind the main army. Here we go. reinforcing the left flank cavalry. The Arab vanguard did the same and joined the main cavalry units. It is unusual to see a battle fought in this era which wasn't started by a clash of light skirmishes, but the sources didn't mention this happening, instead mm. insisting that the champions of both sides dueled for a few hours. Wow. In any case, after the screening forces pulled back, a third of the Roman infantry advanced across the front at midday. Soon, the Roman footmen clashed with their counterparts, while the archers in the second rank skirmished, sending volleys above the heads of their infantry. The details of this first day are scarce, but it is possible that the Byzantines decided that a reconnaissance in force would provide benefits. Their attack was slow and lacked determination. Mm. After a few hours of fighting, they disengaged and returned to their initial positions. The first day of battle was over, and the sides returned to their respective camps. At night, a few Roman light cavalry units moved forward, but they were caught by their Arab counterparts and forced back. These raids were seemingly disjointed and lacked an objective, as they were not conducted by nearly enough troops to do much damage. However, they allowed the Romans to form up in the darkness without alerting the enemy. Mm. The plan was to attack the Muslims as early as possible, not giving them the opportunity to get into formation. Okay. Indeed, the whole Roman army attacked before dawn. Some sources claim they knew of the Muslim religious rites, that one of their prayers happened at this time, and decided to use it to their advantage. Yeah, perhaps. Maybe they were taking advantage of that. That would be an intelligent move, but... I think it's also pretty likely that they were not aware of that tradition uh, and were just going for a sort of basic surprise, you know, attack before they're ready. Um, may have had nothing to do with uh, uh, any religious traditions or practices, um, especially given, you know, I, I really don't think at this point the Romans were very familiar at all with, uh, you know, Islam or Muslim practices or anything like that. I think they were quite unfamiliar, in fact. Unfortunately for the attackers, the same light cavalry patrols who fought them during the night were ordered to remain in front, and as soon as mm. the Romans came into contact with these forward units, the Arabs retreated to their main force and informed them of the impending attack. To the surprise of the Romans, their foes managed to prepare for the attack. However, they had their orders, and so the second day of the battle began. The Roman plan was to tie up the Muslim army's center and pressure its wings. To that end, the attack in the middle was relatively passive. The Byzantine left attacked the Muslim right head-on. The first two attempts to break through failed, but the Byzantines had a numerical advantage and used it. Fresh troops moved to the front and the third attack pushed the Arabs back. Some of them started retreating towards their camp, and some joined the center-right. This opened a way for a counter-attack by the Arab right-wing cavalry. Its charge wasn't strong enough to force the Romans back, but tied them up for some time, allowing the infantry to retreat. Soon, I mean, the counter-attack is definitely a good idea, but even still, the Romans are still pushing forward, so... Um, this could be about to go very wrong for the Muslim forces. I mean, you could see a scenario in which this is where the Romans gain that upper hand and close in on the rest of the Muslim forces. I guess we're going to see if that happens or not. The cavalry was unable to withstand the pressure and also retreated. Later, Muslim sources mentioned that the wives of the retreating warriors shamed them into returning to the battle. We don't know if that is true but the Arab right flank reformed. I mean, maybe. It sounds kind of made up. <laughs> that sounds, uh, <laughs> I don't know, like a story invented afterwards, I would say. What, they went back and 
their wives were like, get back on the battlefield. Like, what? I'm the one fighting. Like, no thank you. <laughs> I mean, maybe. I guess it's possible. ...and started marching towards the approaching enemy. Meanwhile, the Roman right, which was probably made of the best heavy infantry in the Empire, was even mm. more successful. Some sources mention that... Yeah, and you know... Um, we have talked a lot so far about the composition of the Muslim forces and the Roman forces, um, but it is worth reiterating that, of course, the Roman really the Romans really had the advantage of this heavy infantry, uh, and they had you know really always had good infantry compared to many of their opponents, and so I'd say that's probably one of their biggest advantages. Whereas one of the biggest advantages of the Muslims is, of course, their very skilled cavalry, very maneuverable, mobile. Um, but the Romans do have these skilled, heavily armored infantry who, in a one-on-one -on -one battle, you know, I, I would definitely trust them to hold their ground and push more than the Muslim infantry. I think they have an advantage there. That it was fighting in a testudo formation, but that mm. is probably an anachronism. In any case, ah. the first or the second attack by this group drove the Muslim left flank back, and they hastily retreated towards the camp. Similar to what happened on the other side of the battlefield. But of course, you know, the Muslims are aware of this, and so they're getting pushed back. Instead of continue to take heavy losses, the Muslim infantry retreats back to camp, and the cavalry approaches to, um, you know, give them uh, their advantage in battle. Field. The Muslim cavalry attempted to stem the enemy advance with a counterattack, but it failed, and the horsemen joined their infantry en route to the camp. Wow. The sources once again claim that their wives urged them to return <laughs> to the battle, and even threw stones at their husbands. Wow. As the Roman okay. right was slower due to its heavier armor. Are you more scared of the Roman infantry or your wives throwing rocks at you? That's a choice you've got to make there. <laughs> of course, if that story is true at all, which I seriously doubt. The Arabs had more time to rearrange their line and move towards the Romans. I'm surprised the Romans uh, and all that pushing didn't get an opportunity to sort of turn around and flank the rest of the Muslim forces, but maybe it's just that the Roman forces were not mobile enough or not able to reorganize uh, and turn fast enough. Maybe it was that, I'm not sure. An attentive viewer might ask why the Byzantines didn't exploit these breakthroughs by pouring troops between the gaps in the Muslim formations. Okay, they're answering my exact question. <laughs> or by outflanking the enemy right by widening the front. Mm. In truth, we don't have answers to these questions. But ah. it can be assumed that the fresh Muslim cavalry in the center and in the reserve probably discouraged the former, while the latter was dangerous due to the fact that the Arabs had already used desert terrain numerous times in the past to outflank the Byzantines. Yeah, I mean, I guess we don't truly know. Um, you know, classic uh, ancient history. What's the answer to that? Well, we don't really know. Um, but the assumptions that they presented do seem plausible. I suppose either way, it might have been too much of a risk for the Roman forces to take either of those actions. And so they were sort of content with what they were already doing, which, um, you know, was successful up to this point. It was noon, and Khalid had just been watching the battle until that moment. But seeing the return of the wings spurred him into action, taking mm. command of the cavalry in the center. First, his united cavalry force charged to the right, and moments after joining up with the right wing, attacked the enemy left. The Romans didn't expect an attack from the flank and were forced to retreat to their original positions, losing men along the way. Mm. To the south, the left of the Caliphate's army was about to engage the Byzantine right. Initially, the Arabs were getting the worst of the fight and were about to break and flee again. I would say, with this massive pitched battle, this might be the most cautious we've seen both the Romans and the Muslims in this whole series. I mean, they're fighting, like I said, a professional pitched battle. They have to be careful not to take drastic actions or make any big mistakes because you could be losing tens of thousands of men. So they are both uh, being quite careful 
um, pulling back, pushing forward, you know, doing what they can. However, Khalid was on his way. He sent one unit of his cavalry to exploit the gap between the enemy right and center right, and mm. charged the rest into the side of the Roman right. As mentioned, this was the best Roman infantry, so they resisted longer than their counterparts and suffered fewer casualties, but still retreated. Mm -hmm. The cavalry unit sent to attack the Roman center right surprised the latter, managing to break in and killing the commander of this group. Uh -oh. The Romans recovered from their surprise and pushed back the attackers. Of course, now we are seeing some sort of classic uh, hit-and-run cavalry tactics from the Muslims. Even though this is in the context of a much larger battle, they're still repurposing uh, these hit-and-run attacks uh, to be effective. However, seeing that their flanks were retreating, the center also broke off and returned to their starting positions. Mm. Both parties probably suffered similar casualties, with the majority of the Arab losses during the early retreat. Yeah, I, I would say earlier in the battle, the Romans definitely held the upper hand, but the Muslims did manage to sort of bring it back near the end and find some successes. Um, so fairly evenly balanced for both. But of course, um, though we don't know the exact numbers that the Romans had, if they are losing the same amount of men, that's going to be far worse for the Muslim forces because we do know at the very least that the Romans did outnumber them. So losing the same number, um, that's more a victory for the Romans than for the Muslims. The Roman right lost the most troops, and that would prove to be important during the next day. Uh -oh. As this detachment started its advance alongside the whole army, but stopped well short of the enemy army with archers on both sides entering a half-hearted skirmishing contest. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Roman center-right engaged the Arabs, but this attack only served to tie up this portion of the opposing army. Mm. The main attack targeted the right and center-right of the Muslim army, and although initially the Roman onslaught was slowed, their numbers started to play a role. The Muslims started to retreat, especially on the right flank, where their line was pressed all the way up to the camp yet again. This allowed the Romans to increase the pressure on the rightmost units of the Muslim center-right and start turning the line. Amir's corps finally reformed and returned to the battle, but all their efforts only managed to stabilize the line. Right. The Arab cavalry in the second line attempted to outflank the Romans, but Canatir moved his own to block off this advance. Okay, so similar thing as yesterday, except the Romans are pushing the Muslim forces back even further, and the Romans have actually managed to use their own cavalry to prevent a flanking maneuver. So, once again, early in this battle, it does seem like it's going quite well for the Romans. Seeing that the Roman right was being passive, Khalid deduced that his left was safe. Oh, here's Khalid, though. <laughs> he moved the reserve cavalry to the right and charged the Roman flank. Mm. The Byzantine commander attempted to move more troops from his second rank to widen his front, and it worked for some time. However, the Romans now lacked their previous depth. Yeah. No, I can see how the, the lack of troops, the troops they lost in the previous days coming into this, because, you know, they can form a line to fight off the Muslim forces, but now there's no reinforcements, there's no depth. Um, if the Muslims manage to break through this line, then, you know, it's going to go very badly for this flank. And with this advantage negated, the Arabs in the other parts of the line started to push back. Mm. Approaching dusk, the continuation of the battle became impossible, and the attackers disengaged, retiring to their initial line. It is clear that the Romans were getting frustrated, as they expected their numbers to prevail at this point in the engagement. Yeah. In the first three days, the Romans probably lost more troops, but they still outnumbered their foe. Meanwhile, for Khalid, the main worry was the losses among the Yemeni archers and on the right flank. Yeah, I would say that Roman flank is starting to look concerning, but at this point, it's still pretty evenly matched. I mean, it really could go either way. I think it really depends on, from this point onward, which side is performing better, which side is making mistakes, 
And if the Romans are starting to get frustrated and they just want to end this battle, then that could lend itself to mistakes being made. But that doesn't have to happen. You know, like I said at this point, it, it does seem like it could go either way. The Roman plan for the next day was to attack the right half of the Caliphate's army to divide mm. it and encircle each corps separately, and then do the same with the left half. To that end, their left attacked the Muslims, and soon the right flank of Khalid's army was shoved back yet again, but not as far as in previous days. Made up mostly of the Armenians, the Roman center left was equally successful against the Muslim center right. Mm. This time, the Roman troops were able to turn this portion of the Arab line, which opened up space between their corps and the Christian Arab light cavalry, which was stationed in reserve behind the center, was commanded to charge into this gap. All right. For once, a Roman cavalry advance. Um, here we go. The Muslims were suffering heavy casualties, and it was becoming clear that Khalid needed to move to the area to stop the Romans from winning. Before he did that, though... Yeah, once again, uh, it's sort of a repeat. Uh, the Romans are pushing back. What are the Muslims going to do? Uh, call Khalid over. He'll deal with it. Um, that's a joke, but obviously his force of uh, mobile, sort of roving cavalry uh, is very key to the Muslim survival here because he's able to sort of micromanage this from afar. If he sees um, a wing or a flank of the battle going badly... He can command his men to move over there and bail his men out. That's so far been a, a big element of Arab, of Muslim survival in this battle. He sent word to the left and center-left, ordering them to advance and tie up the forces in front of them. Mm. With that, the Arab commander divided his cavalry into two halves. One of them moved to the left and attacked the Armenians from the side and rear while Khalid himself moved against the Christian Arabs. Mm -hmm. The arrival of the reinforcements invigorated the beleaguered Muslims, and they counterattacked. The fight here continued for a few hours, until eventually the Muslims started gaining the upper hand. There we go. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm on this battle, I, I'm not sure how clear the details are from our sources. Um, I do think we have more detail on this battle than a lot of the others because of how important it was. But, you know, if what we're being presented with is even remotely accurate, Khalid is absolutely key to um, what is happening right now. Without him, it really does seem like the Romans would have overrun their opponents uh, already. Engaged from three sides, the more heavily armored and disciplined Armenians suffered some casualties but were still able to retreat in relative order. Mm. Their Christian Arab allies weren't as able to defend themselves and lost many hundreds before they were able to return to their initial position. Seeing that their center had fallen back, the Roman left also disengaged. However, the left half of the Muslim army was still in Malay. Initially, the Arabs had the upper hand as their charge surprised the Romans but their commanders steadied the troops, and soon they were pushing back. The small number of Arab archers proved to be their undoing, as the Romans had the upper hand in skirmishes. Wow. Apparently, the arrows did so much damage to the forces of the Caliphate that later Arab sources called it the Day of Lost Eyes. Jesus. Unable to withstand the volleys, the Arabs started to pull back. Shortly after, they were followed by the Romans. This attack I mean, had the Muslim forces on the back. I'm not going to lie, this is looking pretty dangerous for the Muslim forces right now. Um, I mean, they started out outnumbered and they're losing a lot of men to the Romans. This is looking bad. Back foot and in full flight. All of them except the leftmost unit of the center, which managed to crush the enemy detachment in front of it and attacked the right side of the Roman center. Mm. Eventually, this group was overwhelmed. The Muslim withdrawal stopped around the camps, but they were chased by the Romans. According to the Arab sources, the Muslim women joined their brethren in the fight against the attackers. Wow. It is impossible to confirm it, but it seems that by the end of the fourth day of the battle, the Roman... Once again, we don't know if that actually happened. Um, I will say, 
I mean, in a situation where they're pushing right back to the camp, per- perhaps that would happen. I don't really know. I- I'm not from familiar with the norms of this time, if that would be a normal thing, um, if everyone in the camp would mobilize to go help out or not. Um, but, I mean, perhaps. ...were either pushed back or disengaged on their own. Both sides were extremely tired and battered. Some sources mention that there was an attempt to negotiate from the Romans and that the Arabs refused. Wow. But in any case... I mean, that is pretty cocky at this point. <laughs> to be honest, I, I feel like the, the Muslims are getting the worst of it, and to still refuse negotiations, um, I suppose that is some confidence. Um, I mean, we'll see if it pays off for them, but you know, so far, this battle, it, it's been a tough one. It's been a slog. They've been going for days, pretty evenly matched. Though, like I said, I, I feel like looking at a snapshot of the battle right now, it looks like the Romans have the upper hand. The army spent the 19th of August resting. Khalid made just one change to the formation. All of his horsemen were drawn into one large detachment behind Ooh. the right-wing infantry, okay. save for one cavalry unit, which was sent north into the desert. Khalid is trying to maximize his advantages. You know, he's trying to do what he does best and use his mobility, maneuverability, is cavalry to their absolute maximum effectiveness. At the dawn of August 20th, the sixth day of the battle, both sides charged and engaged in a melee across the line. Mm. After the melee began, Khalid sent a portion of his cavalry forward with an order to attack the side of the Roman left, but upon their approach, Roman cavalry wheeled around their footmen and blocked their advance. That was the moment the Arab commander was waiting for. As Here we go. His horsemen... Khalid's plan is being put into action. Will it work? ...moved forth, attacking the Roman cavalry from the side and rear. Soon, the Roman horsemen were crushed, and the Arabs attacked the infantry, which broke under the attack from three sides yep. and started falling back to the center. The Muslim right now attacked the Roman center left from the flank and rear, Meanwhile, the commanders of the Roman army noticed that their left-wing cavalry was being routed from the field by the mm. consolidated Arab cavalry, and they attempted to counter that by bringing their mounted troops together. Unfortunately for the Romans, it was too late, and before they were able to form up, Khalid smashed into them, routing them. The Ro Look at that. This battle's been going on for days, and this is all it took. Um, I mean, it took... A <laughs> A million different elements and factors played into how this battle went, but, you know, just looking at the strategy, Khalid uh, has decided to play to his strengths, play to the strengths of his army, uh, and it uh, appears to be working out for him. But it is just crazy that after all that battling, the fighting, the melee, the pushing back and forth, the careful strategy and tactics, you know, this is what it takes. Roman cavalry wasn't able to resist for long and promptly started to leave the field of battle. Back east, the Armenians were defending against attacks from two sides, and mm. for now were able to hold off the assailants. However, after Khalid dealt with the Roman cavalry and made sure that they wouldn't return, his horsemen charged into the rear of the Armenian formation. They collapsed under the charge and started retreating to the southwest. The Arabs repositioned to attack the center right and the right of the Roman infantry, but before they did, the latter fled on their own, again to the southwest, towards the only crossing over the river. Mm -hmm. All the while, the Muslim cavalry blocked off their retreat from the north and footmen from the east. The remains of the Roman army were hoping to cross Wadi Rakad, but the 500-strong Arab mounted unit sent away into the desert yep. had already been commanded to block off this crossing. You know, they, they show that earlier, you know, Khalid sends this one unit to go way far up to the north. Um, I mean, that's some foresight. It's also a bit of confidence because he's saying, you know what, I'm not going to need these men during the battle, or at least during the meat of the battle. I'm going to save them for later. You know, they are going to come in handy uh, if, or he's probably thinking when the Romans are forced to retreat. Uh, and luckily enough, 
you know, he's uh, his plan has worked out. The Romans are retreating, and now this cavalry unit is coming in handy. Understanding that they were in a trap, the Roman officers attempted to form up some kind of defensive line, but before they could do it, they were attacked by the cavalry from the north and the infantry from the east. Jeez. It was a slaughter, and many thousands were killed in this encirclement, with some units managing to cross the river by swimming. Around Brutal. Absolutely brutal. Um, I mean, they fought well. They fought bravely. They did all they could, but in the end, just a really, you know, brutal battle. And half of the Roman army lay dead on the plain of Yarmouk, while the Muslims lost less than a fifth of troops. Jesus. All right, and I think we're going to end it here um, because we have been going for quite a while at this point. Um, you know, we've got one more episode left, part four. Um, and so in that one, I'm sure we'll talk more about uh, the aftermath of the Battle of Yarmouk. Um, but like I said, this was a very important one. I'm sure you can see why. This is a major Muslim victory over the Romans. Um, yeah, kings and generals did a really good job presenting it. Um, very uh, entertaining, very interesting. You know, this battle was... It was a long one. Uh, it was a major pitched battle. It was a slog at times, pushing back and forth for hours and hours on end. But, you know, and both sides fought well. Both sides fought bravely. The Roman infantry were definitely uh, the highlight of that force. Um, their heavily armored infantry really showed their worth. Um, and then, uh, of course, for the Muslims, you know, Khalid and his cavalry were the highlight. Um, and the reason they were able to win was because uh, Khalid was able to uh, promote his advantages, um, use his cavalry in a different way to, uh, you know, really do what he did best. And he was able to win through that. So, yeah, uh, this was a good one. Like I said, I'm sure we'll get more into the aftermath of the battle uh, in the next part. If you guys enjoyed this one, I'd appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. I hope you guys are all having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.